colleagues from in situ so we know in situ for many many years we use their products but we never met them physically so this is a good opportunity for us and for you all to meet colleagues from in situ adam and kanai they will introduce themselves more so you will learn about them more and we are glad that this connection worked through sai power tech sai power tech has been our partner in different Activities for quite some time now. So we have two colleagues from Sai Power Tech, Pami and Abasi. So you have been taught about the theoretical part of groundwater monitoring, water level, water quality, these kind of things. So today our colleagues from In Situ and Sai Power Tech they will, they will tell you how things are done in the field, how these kind of sensors are prepared, how they are installed. So you'll see a live demonstration of everything alongside some pictures. And Adam is a professor as well. So he will know how to teach you the things. And Kanaya is from Bombay. So you can talk to him about Bollywood movies as well. Apart from <laughs> Pathan. Pathan? <laughs> so we hope that we'll have a Right session, and session and we plan to continue it until 11.30 and if you are more interested they are happy to stay here for longer until around midday. So with these few words over to you Hamid to start the session. Thank you sir for giving me the floor. I am a basic engineer so uh, working in different sectors like uh, uh, I am in your software uh, working as senior manager for the conditions of London for site power group. Uh, I am basically looking after two teams. One is business development, one is project. So I am the connecting bridge actually. So today we have we are very lucky that Sir is uh, <coughs> is giving us a chance to represent our company as well as uh, our um, our solution. That we are, uh, we, 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 are, we, are, we are providing. So uh, basically, our session is tech session on groundwater monitoring with modern instrumentation. I will take only very few minutes. Basically, after that, you will have the whole session. And I know you all are excited to hear uh, more about this kind of thing from Mr. Kanaya and Mr. Adam. I will just introduce ourselves because I, I think you should know that some local company. Is working with the geologists like Mr. Abbasi, and uh, my boss is your, your alumni, uh, Mr. Lokman Khushan. Uh, today he is uh, he's busy with some other meeting. So, uh, 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 not only the government job, like us, there are some companies who are working for the geologists as well. I think this is a good news, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So today, uh, uh, me, I uh, will present uh, about my company and we are uh, working for and after that Mr. Kanaya and I, so I'm uh, director of the Institute and Mr. The, Mr. Adam Hobson will present. Okay. So basically, size power group, we are saying, we are combining the nature, power, ICT and technology for a beautiful future. So what that it means? It, it, it means that we are just, we are, we are, we are everywhere. So here you can see what we are working for, like from we are manufacturing battery, LED lights, renewable energies, we are having process plants, we are also also installation for the process plant, and Cyportech is the only company in the Bangladesh we are working for the port operations. We are operating, you know that uh, import and export we are uh, uh, most of the uh, in Bangladesh we are going through the sea. So we are here, we are actually 95% uh, of the import and exports is basically handling by our company. So we have the port operations for Mangla port, Shekhar port, uh, in Kamala port ICT, Paira, then uh, uh, Kamala uh, port ICT and the Pandal. As well as we have our own port. Not only that, you will be very glad to know that we are also operating in the Dubai port as well. And we have our own mother vessel. Your local company, your company is basically working in Dubai, working in Abu Dhabi uh, and operating their projects. So it's a good achievement, right? Anyway. 
We are also for working for the generators. We are uh, we are also for the data loggers for the uh, yeah, for the hydro and metallurgical sector. So that's basically our core business. It's a 30, uh, 31 years old company. So this is all of our concern. I will not uh, I will not go in depth. So only that uh, we are uh, we are functional handling company, project management. Other than uh, uh, that, we are we are we are expertizing. And there are some key points like we are uh, we are in Bangladesh with uh, and, and, and 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 in the around the globe with eight thousand plus employees. We have our eight thousand plus employees in our team. And in Bangladesh, we are in the fifty two districts. And in the in, in the globally, we have our office in Bangladesh, <coughs> India, Singapore, UAE, and, and Africa. And we are the top hundred companies in the Bangladesh right now. So you know the, uh, your site. Hydro metrology and geophysical. After joining your department, the Minister Lokman Bhushan, from 2018, we have started our journey with the hydrology and metrological sector. Uh, earlier then, we have only the oil and gas sector. I will come in later. There are some surprises there. So after that, we are introducing data loggers, sensors, wire, these kinds of things. These instruments we are we are very very introducing, like institutes, uh, these kinds of things. We will go in depth. Like capital scientific for the automated weather station and these kinds of things, energy and gas plus, turbulence, infrastructure, soil. Even this is the most, most, most interesting part. We are here with your company with some projects as well, with your, your departments. You have seen the logo, have university, we have done this project for your department in the in the Toxus Gosa, the pretty groundwater modeling unit, where your all of your distinguished stars were there. And we have also done a project in the Dasko, <coughs> that's in Rashadi. So, Rashadi Chapinama for the Borendro area. Like here, uh, we have also done a project uh, uh, with your department uh, for the digital management. Like this is for Dasko project, this is your Godfather project, this is for the uh, your digital uh, management department, and some of our instruments that we have, uh, we have supplied. And we have also in the oil and gas. So basically, I am sending this uh, only that. This is also your interest part. We have done uh, similar uh, similar type of symposium earlier on the horizontal drilling. I, I, I don't know you have uh, you have joined or not. Even we do the hmm, these kinds of things, RMS vertical drilling. And I think you know this picture. This is here. We have done the same symposium here for the uh, for the hydro uh, for the horizontal drilling. And recently we have our own, we have UGP and, and you will be glad to know that we are the first company in Bangladesh. We are brought, uh, we are here, we are bringing basically uh, our horizontal <laughs> drilling machine and the, and the oil and compressor and also we will have, uh, you will have the driller. It's around 300 crore investment and this is with the ministry. And this is the first company we will bring for you. And this is some projects. And we will have our also software company. That's it for you uh, for my part. And Mr. Kanai and I, I will send it over the floor to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Do you need to wear this now, right? Yeah, this is better with this. I did better. <laughs> Movie stars. <laughs> can't <laughs> 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 Okay, Good morning, everybody. My so. Fami did, did a very good introduction about our product, so I don't need to go detail about it. My name is Kaya and I have 15 years in water chemistry. Not a geologist, not a hydrologist, so you guys know more than me. Uh, I'm a salesperson. I'm here to. Uh, <laughs> this is really like a movie. So again, my name is Kanya Naik, I'm in the industry for almost 15 years with water. I'm here with my colleague Adam. Adam is a hydrogeologist. So he can talk about your language and I can talk about more of a sales language. Uh, just give you five minutes for about our company. What we do is we develop innovative technology to use monitor and protect water resource. 
One of the reasons why we are here in Bangladesh or we were in Malaysia as well as in Japan just to interact with you guys, understand what you need and how that need can be transferred into an easy to use product. That is what our role is all about. So we, we do a lot of innovation in terms of technology. Our company is the first company also to manufacture diesel oxygen, uh, luminescent diesel oxygen. And on the other side, our, our company is connected to groundwater. Actually, how? Because our owner, uh, Mr. Mickey, in 1976, he was a professor like you guys, uh, sir, and he had an opportunity to work as a consultant for mining organization. Uh, during his work, uh, there, is, there was a big need for water level, and that is how the first commercial water level in the world was invented by our company, this is and from there, we are keep on inventing the instrument which can be used for groundwater. So I proudly feel that we are connected to groundwater. If you also looking at our logo, the, the flower, what is that? Anybody knows about what is that actually? So it is it is sort of a connected, this whole logo is connected to mining. Uh, the, the four pellets or the flower is an injection well. Uh, the middle one is a projection or product projection well and the upper side of the round ring which is nothing but the uranium so we are connected to groundwater and this is what our company is from the groundwater we are going towards water quality which is what again connected to groundwater or surface water uh, one thing about our organization is if you see really the industry uh, most of the people is putting 5% of their margin or the profit into R&D we are the only few companies who are putting almost around 11% back to the uh, R&D which is helpful for innovating the new product. One of the things what we do is also not only do R&D but also support for the customer. One of the good examples is Adam here. Adam is hydro geologist and his role is to support customer. Likewise Adam, Adam is specialized for groundwater. We do have two other colleagues who are responsible for surface water and a coastal water. And their role is to really think about how they can help customers, how they can help scientists like you to do more of innovation and to understand what are your needs and then bring the ideas to our organizations to make a new product. Again, what Sir was talking about is I learned something today, 5S. We have 4S, which is going to be the 5S because we are going to have an office, uh, we are going, we already have an office in Singapore. But we are going to start our service center in Singapore very soon. The only reason is right now, frankly, even I hate when people have to call requests for the support. That's not what we need. We need some, something to be local. One of the reasons why we appointed Fami and Abbasi here is because they are local and they can talk and they can solve a lot of problems locally here. Uh, we also have a person based in Singapore. Uh, he's a technical person, so you can connect with him directly. And also you can connect with us in the US, uh, only the challenge is time difference of 12 hours. But that's why we want to be a local now. Uh, I will not go over overview about our product, but we are into water level, uh, water quality, diesel, uh, mainly into flow, process instrumentations, telemetry, and also nowadays you guys are more like Karthik Aryan, right? You are a young generation. You don't like to go to the site and go for the data. So what Karthi Narayan like is to use his cell phone, likewise you guys. So we have everything available on your cell phone. So all the uh, data directly you can get on your cell phone from our cloud server or your own server. So we are going into your age rather than sitting with Sarukh Khan and just doing like this all the moment. So that is what we are going to do. Uh, again, uh, what when we sell our products, and our products can be used for groundwater, lake rivers, storm water, energy, mining and coastal. Uh, last slide is about what we do. We are not here only to sell, but we have a lot of education information on our website. So if you guys have a time, please go to our website and go to the support. You will find many podcasts for groundwater, surface water, coastal water. We have case studies, we have some of the customer interviews. So if you want to learn more about reality, what is happening, it is available. Hopefully we will have some case study from you guys uh, once your project is done and maybe Sir can allow us to publish something for your organization. And that is for me. Uh, so this is just a picture. I like this slide because we were in Japan where it was minus 10 degree and this is last week. 
and today we are in Bangladesh, which is around 30 degrees centigrade. So from minus 10 to 30, but we are still here and we love it. So thank you for your time, I appreciate it. I'll hand it over to Anand. Not yet, sorry. Thank you everyone for having us here and joining us with this. Um, this is exciting for us. Uh, and real quick, as Penea said, I do actually encourage everyone to come up front because I'm actually going to be showing some things here. It's not going to be as much up on the screen. So feel free to come up close. I, I don't bite, I swear. Kanae knows I'm traveling for three weeks now. He knows that. Um, again, thank you so much for having me here uh, and having us here. This is, it's an honor for us to be here. Like I said, I traveled halfway around the world to be here, and we wouldn't do that unless we saw a real need for it. Uh, we want to get out and meet folks like yourself, students in particular, is so important. Um, one thing that we want to always think about with any kind of environmental monitoring, especially in our studies, we learn all about these theory. We look at things in textbooks. We read these documents. We do stuff very much at arm's length. We have a lot of talking and all that. Geology, environmental sciences, water sciences, and all of that is not just that. It's getting out there and getting in the field. It's touching things. It's getting it and actually getting dirty. It's getting wet. And you need to be able to do that. Today I talked about our, 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 our adventures so far here going from negative 10 to 30 to plus 30 degrees C. Yep. That's, that's, a, that's a business trip, but that's, that's a typical day in the field. And you need to be ready for that. But that's also, you need to have a passion for that. You need to be ready to do it. Okay. So field work's real important. But getting your hands dirty and understanding how you can actually collect all these data that you've been talking about. You've done these theories. You've un you understand that whether it's an aquifer test, whether it's a lithology log, whatever it may be, you can talk about it all you want. But until you get your hands on that data, it won't really mean a whole lot to you. Okay. Now, one thing we're going to talk about today is just the actual instrumentation that we use to collect that sort of data. And I, any, if I, one recommendation if I have for you is get your hands on this equipment. It's going to help you. Just having these degrees and this experience is wonderful. You need to know how to actually do it. And you need to know how to use the tools. As we always say, you know, carpenters can go and, and you know, they can study wood and all that, and different shapes and forms and all that. You need to know how the tools actually work. These are the tools that you need to be able to use. Okay. Um, one thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to be talking a lot and showing a lot of things. But what I would like to really encourage you is for you to ask questions. Please engage. If you don't understand something, raise your hand and ask. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, I, I'm from the United States. My English may be a little different. I try to speak slowly and clearly, uh, but if I, you don't understand something, please let me know. I may use words you don't understand. Ask, what do I mean by that? Okay, so please engage. This is not just me talking to you. I want to hear from you in this whole conversation. That sound good? Yes, yes very good. Uh, very good. I need to hear from you. That's a shape of the Okay. Um, actually, real quick, by the way, I did I, I got a, a brief introduction, but just so you guys know who, who I am. Um, again, my name is Adam Hobson. Um, I am a hydrogeologist um, and a professional geologist, and I'm also an engineer. I kind of play a lot of different roles. Um, I spent about 25 years in the consulting world, doing environmental consulting uh, all over the world, actually. I, I, made an interesting observation a few years back that I've actually done hydrology projects on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, that's kind of neat. I'm actually kind of proud of that myself. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, but also dealt with a lot of different 
uh, geologic, hydrogeologic, um, and just hydraulic environments, uh, which has been very, very nice and kind of nice, nice opportunity. About five years ago, I, I changed and left consulting and decided to actually join in situ uh, for the reason that I had actually been a customer of in situ for my entire career. And I had been a long time user. And in situ actually reached out to me and said, hey, we think that maybe having a hydrogeologist on our staff would be really valuable. And as Kanea pointed out earlier, we've actually gone beyond just one hydrogeologist. We're actually adding other water scientists, including surface water hydrologists and an oceanographer to do our coastal work. Uh, we also are continuing to expand that. Um, and we bring that up because not many other organizations who manufacture equipment <coughs> have that knowledge. They don't have people who have this type of of experience to bring to you. We're not here to sell. I'm here to help you understand and understand these applications for our products and how they work. Sound good? Anyway, what I want to give you a quick overview here is what in situ actually offers. There's a whole bunch of stuff. With groundwater, we tend to think of just a few things, namely water level, um, and also potentially what we refer to as CTD or conductivity temperature depth sensor. Uh, those are very common, those absolutely are, are real valuable in groundwater and geological environments. However, water quality is, um, is also a very important role here. Dissolved oxygen and multi-parameter signs, we'll talk about the parameters we do here in a minute. Uh, but to understand that, uh, the value of that type of instrumentation as well is critical for understanding the, uh, the environments that you may be working in uh, to address the challenges you may be trying to solve. Um, another thing we have again is, uh, is flow meters. Flow is one thing that, as a hypergeologist, I always thought I don't need to deal with that. That's the surface water side of things. However, as it turns out, you actually deal with it all the time. But as you, many of you probably know, the fundamental fluid mechanics apply not only to surface water flow, but actually very much to groundwater. You need to understand both in order to do that. By understanding flow systems, you can actually uh, get better information on your geology and your water hydrologic system and be a well rounded scientist and contribute to whatever project you may be working with. Um, we talked about a little bit about mobile applications here. Yes, everything now is going to the cell phone. I bet most of you have a smartphone. Um, most people around the world actually do. Um, so we believe that this is really the way to go. How do you share <coughs> with, uh, with your instrumentation? If you do everything else on your phone, why not collect your data that's on your phone? Uh, telemetry, we're going to talk a bunch about this today. Uh, telemetry is critical. Um, talk a little more about why that's really, that's very valuable um, in a little more depth, but with any project you want to consider telemetry. Because having just one sensor out there is valuable. But what if you could have 10, 20, 30 sensors covering a wider area? And then it becomes, well, if I have 30 sensors out there, how do I get to them? How do I maintain them? How do I deal with all that data? I can't necessarily go out to all those sites all the time. Telemetry can be the answer. A lot of times where we work is not necessarily in, like I mentioned, the temperature differences. Well, maybe there's other things you have to worry about, like safety. It's more just travel logistics. Safety is the one I always like to bring up because um, I, I, as a quick little side story, every time I travel to a project, I've been looking at warning signs of where I go. And it could be anything. And I have ones about there's either like a cliff fall, like you could fall off of something, or uh, my favorite was in Australia. And I'm in an area installing instrumentation. I came across a warning sign. And what was the warning sign? It had a little, had a picture of a you know, stick figure of a, of a person, and it's a big jaws. Anybody know what it is? Crocodile. You guys know crocodile? Saltwater crocodile? Yeah. One of only two species that actively hunts people. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, these are in interesting environments, right? I'd like to put telemetry there and not go back. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to get more crocodile stories. I have a few, which is fine, but that's, that's the way. Telemetry is valuable. And you can just collect your more data. You can be in the safety of your own home, your own office, or you can be anywhere in the world and still collect that data. And that's very important. Part of that then is maybe your data services on that. Make sure your data is actually being delivered up 
to where you actually need it to be so you can use it in the way that you need to do it. Apply it to the models that you need to run. Just uh, analyze your data. You need to be able to have a data services program that was linked between your instrumentation and all the other work that you need. Does that all make sense? Kind of big overview? Very good. Okay. So, I want to talk a little about parameters and things that, that, that we as a company in particular do, but these are actually very important for, again, kind of hydrogeology and hydrology type studies that you may have. We talked initially about uh, pressure or level. I'm going to show this here. Uh, hopefully, many of you will understand that relationship that in order you can actually measure the height of a fluid based on the pressure in there. Fluid mechanics, if you need more on that information, you can talk about that. That's a fundamental way that pressure transfer and uh, fundamental measurement for, uh, for groundwater. Another one is uh, temperature and conductivity, two of the most important water quality parameters you'll ever measure. Um, if you ever do any type of, of water quality monitoring, I encourage you always have those two. That's going to be your baseline. Other things that you may see out there, dissolved oxygen is very important. You can understand the environment that may be in there. Is it aerobic, anaerobic? Um, maybe do this with um, different habitats and things like that, and you know how much oxygen is in there. Turbidity. Hopefully you're all familiar a little bit with turbidity, kind of that clarity of the water it can be very, very important. We had actually had a good conversation about uh, with some uh, with some other folks during our travels here about the rivers around here and how turbid they are. That has a big uh, big impact there. Um, I mentioned here fluorometers. Is that, has anyone heard that term before? Fluorometer? Anybody? Not a bit, yes, no, no, sounds like no. Okay, talk a little bit about what a fluorometer is. Is that the idea is that it will emit in a particular sort of light in a certain wavelength, and then whatever it's trying to measure absorbs that light and then re emits a different wavelength light. It fluoresces. Okay, you may have seen there's um, items out there that glow in the dark. Right, you expose them to the sunlight and then they, they glow in the dark. If you put them in a dark room, they kind of emit both different light. That's fluorescence. So it's really interesting that there's many, there's quite a few uh, environmental parameters, environmental uh, uh, things that we're looking at that fluoresce. Okay, and by having that, uh, that by, by knowing what wavelengths they excite at, meaning what they, what they absorb and what they emit at, can be really, really valuable. Now, some things that we're talking about here, what, what kind of parameters are we talking about? Chlorophyll A. Okay, what's in plants? Also in phytoplankton. Blue green algae, very important, uh, uh, important parameter of maybe measure, particularly for surface water on um, the coastal type environments. Um, a few other things we may be looking at here could be something like crude oil. Crude oil comes into, or oil in general, can come into play in many environmental factors, right? Um, and then we also have a few other things that actually again yeah, come into the, to the environmental space a little more regularly is dye tracers. So it's the idea of putting a uh, dye into water and watching where it goes. And there's two very common ones. One is rhodamine and the other is fluorescein. One turns the water red, one turns the water green. It's basically what it is. Um, really important. Um, you don't see as many tracer studies these days uh, because they turn the water an interesting color, but it's, they, they still are out there and can have a lot of value. I encourage you to study up on tracer tests and, and what, what kind of value they can provide if you have them already. Um, so that's a quick little, little quick intro to what fluorometers may be. And um, the other one we have here, though, is an important one, pH. Okay, talking about a pH sensor. Uh, very common, also ORP, which is oxidation reduction potential, or redox. You've heard that. Two things to understand about contamination and that sort of thing in water. And then a few other sensors we have here are ammonium chloride or nitrate chloride. We'll be able to see that down here. It's a little low. Um, those are very common ions that we're interested in in many water quality um, monitoring situations. So those are, those are also out there. Okay. Please. So in Bangladesh, most of the events are only for an average. And you are talking about our instrument is cool. How they can monitor the water quality? We're going to get right into that, actually. We're going to talk about kind of a common installation here in just a minute. Good question, Okay, Thank you for doing that. 
So one of the things that we, where we come from is we actually find that um, water monitoring instrumentation typically has been difficult to use. It's complicated. And he said, there's a lot of things you need to know, right? Well, I get scared using this new stuff. Um, but we don't want them to be complicated. They can be expensive. That's a challenge, right? We'll put stuff out in the field, leaving it for a long time. I don't want to spend that amount of money and just maybe you know, leave it out there. Maybe they'll give you accurate data, right? That's one thing that we've had a lot of people have a challenge with, with all of those things. And I think they're just not reliable. They don't work all the time. <coughs> but what I want to let you know, guys, all of these things are exactly what the hallmarks are that we do, how we design all of our instrumentation. Okay. So some of the things I'm going to talk about here address more generally one of these four things. And they're kind of the overall theme that we have there. Okay. Or where we may be maybe going. Okay. Another thing that we want to make to make things easy to use, we're going to talk about instrumentation. We'll actually take a look at some of these things that we have. Now. Any one of these instruments that we have sitting up here all work in what we call the shared ecosystem. They all work together. The idea is that I can use this as a pressure transducer. This is actually a conductivity sensor and depth sensor. Also, here's a basic pressure transducer, also a conductivity sensor on there. This I can use my mobile phone with the same app, no big deal. I can use the same communication device. I can use a same cable. I can also use the one for water quality as well. All the same stuff. Or in telemetry device. Talk about all these individuals. They all work together. So instead of having to buy one unit for, oh, I'm just doing level, and I have to have a whole setup for that, and then, oh, now I'm going to do water quality, I have to do a whole other setup for that. Oh, by the way, later on, I'm going to connect this to telemetry. Now I can't even use the right cables on that, and I have to learn something totally new. Why don't you get a system that actually designed all of them together in your machine? So from a, a practical standpoint, having everyone work together makes a lot of sense. Okay. Just want to throw that out there. Let's talk about how the stuff is installed. Does anybody out here actually use pressure transducers or water quality instrumentation? Anybody put their hands on this type of instrumentation? No. All right, well, I know our professor here has, so that's good. <laughs> I'd be surprised if you had. <laughs> um, so that's okay. One thing that gets challenging sometimes when you see these type of instrumentation, well, where do they go? Does it sit in the air? What, what, what do I do with it, right? So for what we're talking about here, we have basic simple con uh, uh, configuration. You'll notice that we have two wells, okay? And this doesn't have to be groundwater. It's just the, the concept that we have a tube that goes into water. And it can go into groundwater or surface water. Here, I tend to think a little more groundwater. So we're just kind of focusing on that. Starting at the bottom, we have a sensor like this. This is a, like, like I said, conductivity, temperature, and depth sensor, CTD. This is also, again, water level sensor, pressure sensor that you have down here. That would then connect up to a cable, if you want it to. This is a cable. This can come in a variety of lengths, whatever you, whatever you want it to do. Instrumentation hangs at the bottom. It goes all the way to the top of the well where I can actually access it. Okay. Why do we have this cable? Besides just keeping the instrument in there. Anybody have an idea? What can I do with this cable? Transmit the data. Transmit data, right? I can talk to the instrument that's down the bottom. Okay, that's a real nice feature to be able to have. You don't have to. You can program instrumentation at the surface and then deploy it down the well on a, on, a, on a wire or something like that. But then it just sits there and I don't know what's going on. And that's okay. That, that could be very valuable. Your study allows or it, it needs that. Great way to go. A lot of times we want to actually communicate with what's down the well. Okay. Uh, so we have a cable that goes down there and then it comes up to the surface. Well, I need to communicate with Right? Well, there's a couple options that we have. One thing is this little device, and this isn't anything, well, I don't think it's anything special, but it turns out it actually really is. This is a Bluetooth uh, transmitter. It's also a battery. 
So what we can do with this, we can actually then up here at this point, put this on, I can walk up to my well, connect that up, and this is Bluetooth, and my lovely phone has Bluetooth as well, and this is how I connect with my device. I can do everything I need to, I can download my log, I can set up my logs, do all I need to do with it. And then when I'm done, I disconnect, take it, and I walk away. <laughs> and you're good to go. Um, that's great. But again, you don't have any information here. You, 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 you can communicate with it, but you can't, um, I don't know anything why. Right? What if things are changing kind of quickly? Or maybe it's not quickly, but it just takes me, I have to fly two hours and hike six hours and battle crocodiles or whatever it is to get out there. Maybe I don't want to use this. I don't want to walk out to the site. So then you get something like this. Now, if you many of you, I don't know if you've been around telemetry before, but typically we've found that telemetry used to be a very large box. It's called a NEMA enclosure. It's a waterproof box with a, with a door. And inside that sits all these electronics. And all these loose wires come into it, and you have to plug them all in. And usually then there's a battery in there. And then outside there's a big solar panel. And it all has to sit on a post. And you have to install all that. Buy it all. And it. This does all the same thing. It's all it has to do. That's fine. This actually is now designed to actually fit directly inside the well. So you don't have to install a big post. Um, it actually connects directly to the instrumentation. You don't have to do all the special wiring and know. Gee, do I put the red wire here and the black wire here? And what, what do I actually, how do I work with it? And then do some weird programming language on it? So, you can actually program the whole thing just through the app, watch it. But the other thing about that is you don't need a solar panel. And this becomes pretty valuable. A unit like this actually runs just on these cell batteries. You can find these anywhere in the world. Okay. And with a battery situation like this, you'd actually be running. You know, you, you actually, depending on your parameters, year, two years maybe, depending on what you're doing. Typically, it just depends. Could be less, but it's, not, it's, not, it's pretty good. If you use a different type of battery, lithium batteries, and you can actually get this for three to five years on it. Theoretically, you cannot touch your instrumentation for three to five years. Don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> okay, I, so I want to stress that. As much as we say, oh, I can set it and forget it, I can just leave it out there and not worry about it, you can't do that. If any of you have done, you know, if, you, if you've gone to a field site, you're going to go one day and you're going to see it and take a picture of it. Step away for six weeks. Come back. You think it's going to look a little different when you get back? It might. Imagine now if you have something deployed in the water. And you have to there for a year, two years, three years. You think things might look a little different? Yeah, they change. And things that you may not think can change. Maybe something like at the well surface here, you know, it gets overgrown. I can't find it anymore. I have a site in a very tropical location where uh, the wells are, are flush, they're not, they're, they're flush to the ground, so there's no, no pipe. It's just is right level of the ground. And I go there every six months, and every time I go, go out to that site, it is covered with vegetation. I take a machete and cut through it, right? So you gotta make sure you maintain your site. So you need to still go to your site and maintain it. Okay. Uh, but the telemetry has a big advantage. Not only does it just allow you, uh, I start to worry about getting my data, or what about accessing your data, but it actually can send your information out. This has got a cellular network in it. You do have to have cell coverage. I will say that for a unit like this. It can actually send all your information via cellular. Um, via cellular signal. And like I said, that can be set up as fast as every five minutes if you need it, or you can set it once a week, anytime in between. Which means you can be, you can get up in the morning, and you can look at your phone, and I can see how my water level is doing. I can see how my water quality is doing. I can just see what's happening. You can set an alarming condition. Maybe there's something you're concerned about, a water level dropping below a certain point. You can check that. 
You can set it, send it, I'll send you a text. You can actually send it, have, have, send it, have it send you, give you a phone call and give you a warning about it. Or you can just get an email if you want. It's kind of nice. And again, you could have a project all the way over in Canada and you could be here. And you could still monitor your data. No problem. I think she used this very successfully running a, oops, let me make you familiar with the concept of aquifer testing. Uh, the idea of, you know, you actually by pumping a well at a constant rate, you measure the drawdown. Actually using this type of, of setup here, where we're actually monitoring the drawdown. Well, one of the things those tests run for anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, even longer, they actually run a month long pump test. I'm pumping for an entire month. And I'm just talking data the entire time. Well, I can't be at the site all the time downloading data. But I actually had it delivered via telemetry. Well, not only did I have it being delivered telemetry to me, where I was, I was relatively close to the site within a few hours. I actually had the data delivered to actually my colleagues. I, at this time, I was, in, I was actually in Canada at the time. Um, I actually had it delivered to my colleagues in Australia. So when at night, when it was night for me, it was day for them, you know what they were doing? Analyzing the data. So when I woke up, I already had a little bit of an analysis done. Couldn't have done that 15 years ago. It would have been difficult. Now it's very easy to deploy and do all that. So, questions on telemetry. We're going to talk about the pressure transducers and also water quality here now. But any questions on telemetry, what it might be, what it can do? Hopefully your brains are all thinking about this stuff and how you can use it, how they know you know it. All good? It's a great question. So the question was how much of the battery performance impacted by the ambient climate? And the, the, the truth of the matter is it, it can be can be significant, but this is also because we have a long, long, long range of environments we can be operating. In an environment like here, you're actually going to be very good because it's warm. And batteries actually like warm. Now the little downside is humid. <laughs> now that's also that's that's a that goes a that's just a negative category. So yes, that will have some impact on it. The challenge is when you get into very hot or very cold. So temperature tends to be the larger uh, influence on the battery. So uh, again, we have we have these units right now deployed uh, above the Arctic Circle, running on lithium batteries. Yeah. So I have seen battery dying in four months. Which ones? The uh, on the telemetry. Okay. In situ telemetry. Yeah. So my question is, if my parameter is not changing that frequently, mm -hmm. and if I need to go to my site and the cheaper ones for changing the battery, why do I even need to do install the battery? So, the question would be, what type of battery are you using? Is that the mm -hmm. battery that came with it? Like, okay, that's one of the challenges right there. If, you, if, you're, if you're doing, if you're transmitting data very frequently, you're doing once a day? He does once a day. Once a day. How many parameters? Uh, conductivity, uh, water level, temperature. Temperature, okay. So given the environment, depending on the environment, alkaline battery may have a challenge with that, with the frequency of that level. What I recommend doing with something like that, lithium batteries. You're going to see a dramatic increase in your battery. That's, that would be the simple thing on there. It's a, it's a choice of battery. Sometimes the batteries in the sites are not available. We need to, you know, buy the batteries from the outside from Dhaka. We need to send batteries to the site. There, there are many challenges. And another challenge I have faced is like, I couldn't use telemetry in artesian well. Why not? There are because uh, the, the, the this is not waterproof. That guy, so I couldn't really put it in the well. So if I want to use it, I have to hang it, you know, somewhere that there will be any water. So I want to correct one thing on it. This is IP68 rated. I can put it under one meter of water and it's not I I have talked with this. Oh no, but no, 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 please, if you don't mind. The issue is, once this gets wet, above, once you submerge this, there's no signal. Cell signal and Bluetooth do not transmit through water. Okay, that's just a fundamental fact. I, I, I would love to change that as soon as we figure that out. And then 
Uh, but this gets submerged. Stops trans. Now, it does not stop collecting data, but stops trans. Now, so that's one of the reasons why you have to keep it out of the flooded areas. But it can get flooded. And then once it dries out, it picks up again and goes. So that's where we, we end up getting getting a challenge. The antenna on here is actually the weak point. Because an antenna right here, I'm unscrewing it so you can understand that's all that is right there. You have a variety of antennas you can put on there. You can actually get an IP68 rated antenna. Uh, which, I can, which are available, at least there's a common, common antenna, an SMA antenna, um, if you choose to do that. So, another challenge is we, uh, for security purposes, yes. we build a cinematic box on the web, so it is inside the cinematic box, mm -hmm. and that kills the signal. So, it depends on your cell signal strength. Now, one of the things is, is yes, cell signal does not go through absolutely everything. Uh, one, so, you, so a couple things you can do with that is extend your just your antenna outside, and that can be a, a, a good way to solve that. However, one thing that we found, and in fact, I don't think I have a picture of it, but I'll, let me think about that real quick. We have an installation where these are actually submerged underground um, in a steel hole, and they're still submitting, they're still trans. Why? Because A, we have a stronger cell signal, is one thing. But B is actually the technology that's in there. This is not your necessarily your typical cell phone signal. It's category M1 NDIOT signal here, which is a longer wavelength, and it's specifically designed for deep penetration. Where you're going to see this type of technology um, is actually, uh, we see it a lot in generally Internet of Things overall, but I don't know how much. You guys see this, but appliances, you know, so a dishwasher, washing machine, a toaster oven, a coffee pot, even some of these other um, any things, they sometimes have a, 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 a wireless connection. That's the same technology. Why? They're designed to be low power and deep penetration. So if you encase it in concrete, you got to put them. You got to get the uh, get the get the antenna out there. And again, your alternative. Remember what we're coming from, from telemetry. Big box, sitting outside, solar panels, big batteries, and all of that. What we can do is, uh, yeah. maybe after this meeting, let's talk about your own site and see oh, what, yeah. what, like, exactly what we can do, and yeah. let's see if there is any solution. Any other questions on telemetry? We have to talk more about it. Okay. So the other one I talked about real quick is our problem. Okay. Now, I actually refer to this instrument right here, as I mentioned before, this is our CPD measures temperature, gap, yeah, so pressure, and conductivity. Conductivity is usually, the electrical conductivity is about as a water quality parameter, um, but however, given a, a unit like this, we tend to put it also at level because it actually has the same form, the same shape, the same instrumentation style as a, um, as a pressure Yes, there's a question with that. About your telemetry, uh, as we told, mm -hmm. lithium ion tends to uh, change over time. Lithium ion batteries, they deteriorate the ions inside the battery. Uh, over time, uh, it gets, it spoils also. So, is there any chance for the lithium ions, which are deteriorated from the battery, to get dissolved into the water when it is sub uh, submerged inside? So, if I understand the question, I apologize, I couldn't, I couldn't hear as well. The question was about whether or not if batteries get, were they get batteries getting wet and then dissolving in, is that right? The battery, with time, it changes, it deteriorates. Uh, it gets wet, like in our mobile phones, after two to three years, our yeah. battery also gets wet. Yeah, so yeah. These are all lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. So these batteries, when they spoil, they release the ions also inside the battery. So mm -hmm. is there any chance for that telemetry uh, to release the ions inside the water? No, we haven't seen any issue with, with that actually contaminating the water. Now, one thing to be clear on, um, this unit is not designed to be submerged. This sits above the water generally. Now it can get submerged if you have a flooding situation or something like that, but it'll be temporary. We haven't seen this is a fully sealed unit, like it's IP68 rated to design not to even get water inside of it. Now if you took out one of the batteries and threw it in the water, 
I, that would be a different story. Uh, but as, as well as, but in terms of just it making out here that I shouldn't be getting wet, ever. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Very good. Please do. Yeah. 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 We get a sink, so like you, if we use this instrument in the drinking water, what happens? Is there any clients are getting out of it? We already have a place like this in the lab, uh, a private lab, and we don't see any problems. So ideally, the upper part, the telemetry should not go inside the water. It should be away from the water. But in case it goes inside, the pressure will be any problem with these people. Thank you. How many girls can I have to one day? Very good. So you can actually hook up eight instruments, eight instruments on this. Eight? Eight from a, from a from connectivity temperature depth standpoint, you can go to eight. So I didn't really need to buy a If you have a cluster, mm -hmm. four connectivity right at different depths. So we would need ideally one telemetry. <coughs> one telemetry unit out of it. And what you can run on that is then a cable um, situation where you use a splitter. Cables can run down. And you actually have, I don't have one here, I apologize. It actually then splits off, it lives from here, it will be front down. It splits off from there. Oh, was there one thing? Yeah, thanks for reminding me. We didn't know that. So you didn't know that. One thing is, uh, uh, Safe Power Tick is just a new distributor, so we are really working with them right now. <laughs> that can tax some costs. Absolutely. In future, if you need more applications, this time to do that. It's very important for Absolutely. We have. Once they go to each other, for each one we are buying and separate products. <laughs> it's not good for me to get both, but it's not required. So I tell you why, because this particular product that I'm just talking about, this was invented because of the customer in Korea who faced the same problem. So we are looking to solve the situation in January, where we have almost around 200 sites where installation is done. When we, I visited them in 2016, we see like one small well has seven different cables going inside which is impossible to maintain. So one of the idea came from the customer, this is feedback from you guys, and hey, can, I, can we put a chain? And that is how this product was uh, developed. So again, it's a, sorry the information did not come to you, but if you can connect with us also, that would be very helpful, we can do this like this. Okay. Um, so on the, uh, so Good, good question about how many instrumentation you can connect up to telemetry. To telemetry. Um, the nice thing again, you can connect not only water level but water quality uh, instrumentation. Um, and so, this is one version of what water quality instrumentation looks like. Now, coming back, uh, Kanaya asked a great question earlier, which is that many of the wells here are actually one and a half inches. This is actually designed 50 for two inch well, 50 millimeter well. Okay, so to deploy this down, uh, down well would work in a one and a half inch well. But just to understand the concept, you would be looking at again a minimum of a two inch well, and then deploy it exactly the same way, same cable, same telemetry, or Bluetooth connector, power pack. We call it a wireless scroll problem. Uh, but same um, same setup uh, in that uh, in that, that, that same setup. For, excuse me. Uh, however, if you have a one and a half inch well or small, right, or two, anything smaller than two inches, how do you think you could actually measure water quality in that groundwater well? Instead of putting the sensor in the water. What do you think we could do? Can we bring the water to the sensor? Maybe pump it out? Have you guys dealt with groundwater sampling before? Not, not very much. In fact, groundwater sampling. That's going to be another whole, whole thing that we're going to come back and talk about. Groundwater sampling is a real critical component of groundwater investigation. Not just because instrumentation may not fit down well, but the fact is, of those parameters I talked about, that's not all we're interested in. We may be interested in things like arsenic and, and heavy metals, um, maybe you've heard of PFAS. These are all things that, that we, need, we need to measure in groundwater, but can only be done in the lab. They can't be done via in-situ equipment. By in-situ, I mean in place, not their company. 
Um, so in order to do that, we actually have to extract the groundwater from the muck, pump it out. Okay. Now the details of that I'm not going to get into. There's a whole theory behind that that would be it's actually literally part of the whole course. If you are, are interested in it, please check out our website. There's a great 45-minute uh, webinar and explains all of that. Um, the instructor is fantastic. He's super knowledgeable. <laughs> um, I do recommend you check that out. It's a great resource and it's a great illustration of some of the other things that may be available to you just by going to our website. Actually, I would say any manufacturer's website, but usually good resources. Anyway, the idea is you can also extract the water from the from the, from the well and then run it through a basically a what's called a flow cell, which I unfortunately do not have. Oh, actually, so, oh, there it is. Right here. This device right here. This is actually this instrument right here. Set in there, and what we have here is we actually have a pump. We're pumping the water out and runs through this chamber called flow cell. Um, and the reason for that is a separate conversation. But um, you run it through there, and then we can actually measure these parameters in that well. So we can measure any any sensor that we have in there can be used. Um, we can measure all that. Again, using the phone, we can log that data and all that. So you do have an option if you have a smaller well. Now that also means you have to get a pump down. So you can't go, it depends on how deep you can go with that. One and a half inches is hard to pump. Okay. Um, but there may be some other ways to work with that. Okay. Water quality. I want to talk, go back here just so we know kind of what we're looking at here. And deploying something like this down in a well. Okay. Now, one thing that's kind of fun is that this is considered a multi-parameter sum. This is referred to as a restrictor, by the way, and here we talk about that. And that's basically the protector, protecting, protecting casing around our sensor, which all sit right here. Okay, these are all sensors. These are all removable. Okay, it looks like from what you guys can probably see right now, this is one big black cylinder. It's not. In fact, we don't know if I can have a good picture of us. Of uh, what this actually looks like. These sensors, you can choose your sensor. We talked about those in the beginning. PHRP, temperature conductivity, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, fluorometers, blue green algae, chlorophyll, crude oil. Those are all sensors that can be placed in here. Okay. Now there's an interesting part about it. What you may see from other manufacturers in, in a unit like this, many other people make this concept of a multi-parameter sun is that these sensors tend to be, they look like this. They're a cylinder, and there's many of them. Okay, they're not usually as big, by the way, but, and they sit, and they actually all sit at kind of different, different points, okay, and there's a whole cluster of them that come off of this part of the body, which we refer to as a sound, okay. Well, I don't know about you, but this looks a lot more solid, right? And you know what? It is. When I tap it, it's not going to, I'm not going to bang it, it's just not a smart thing to do. But if you did have any issue, you're not worried about breaking a sensor off. With something like these, when they're just independent, I got a big level on that. You can actually break your connection if they, if they get moved. The other thing in here, if I've got these units sitting like this, I can get stuff. Stuff grows in there. I can't clean it very well, right? I may get something in there, but who knows what it might be, whether it's sediment, whether it's some precipitate from my groundwater, whatever it may be in there, and that's going to foul my sense, right? Remember I said they don't necessarily sit at equal levels? Well, if they don't sit at equal levels, it's really hard to clean them, right? Okay. Let's look at something like that. I got a flat face right there. No spaces in between. That looks really easy to clean, if you ask me. Right? So easy, in fact, that you can actually put an automatic wiper on here that will wipe the sensors as often as you want. So every reading, you have a clean sensor. 
long term deployment, easier to use, more reliable data, right? So you can actually do that. You don't have to have that wiper, but you have a, the, uh, the idea of a flat face sensor. Um, so one other thing I want to talk about here with uh, water quality instrumentation is with any instrument that you have um, is calibration of an instrument. Okay, any measuring tool needs to be calibrated. We, you, it, it's a fundamental fact. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a theoretical thing. You have to calibrate instrumentation. We tend not to think about a whole lot. Uh, you know, what I was I was surprised. I use you know use a tape measure. Whether you're measuring the length of this table or the depth of something like that, that tape measure is actually calibrated. And it actually can fall out of calibration. Surprising, but it actually can. In fact, you can buy calibrated tape measures. Okay? They're certified calibrated tape measures. Okay. Well, that's just a tool. Well, in the same in the same concept, water quality instrumentation needs to always be calibrated. The question comes of, uh, well, how difficult is it? How often do I need to calibrate? Okay. Well, let's say, talk about the first question of how often I may need to calibrate. And the answer to that is depends on your science. But I want to give you a, uh, a, an example. pH, very common water quality parameter. We should all be familiar with it in our studies, right? pH, very common. Whether it's an acid, whether it's a base, big deal. It actually drives, after temperature and conductivity, it's actually probably the most important one. Okay, the pH sensor, the way they actually work is there's actually fluid in the sensor. And I don't know if any of you, you're welcome to come up and see something like this, but uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of white spot on the sensor. I don't know how well you can all see that. I apologize. But um, you're welcome to come up after and see it. But that's a pH sensor. Um, I'm sorry, it's actually a light of view sensor. It's not actually a view sensor. It's a light of view sensor. Uh, there's a solution, a fluid in that sensor that's designed to leak out. It has to leak out. It's, it's, it's intentional. So it's got a reservoir, small little volume of fluid that slowly leaks out over time. Because that's how the sensor needs to work. It's a universal thing of how these types of sensors work. It's not unique to us. That is just how they work. Well, if that thing's going to leak out, eventually it's going to be empty, right? You have to be able to refill that. Okay. In addition to that, depending on the type of water you're dealing with and, 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 the, uh, and, and the electrolyte level in there, the calibration will change on that. So what we find is that with, with older instrumentation, calibration could be, many people calibrate them again if they need to, whatever, depending on how they're, how they're using it. But with a long-term deployment, they were finding that they're only getting maybe a week, maybe a month at the most on their calibration. Well, to the question that came up here, well, if I'm doing long-term monitoring, why would I, why would I have long-term monitoring for pH if I have to go out every month anyway and calibrate? I can just go out and maybe do that. Maybe it's not worth it. Well, one of the advantages with some of the sensors that we've designed, they have a much longer, they potentially can have a much longer calibration. Now, it depends on your water and your application. I'll stress that. You still may have a shorter life depending on how you're using it. But we've seen calibration pop up to 90 days just on pH alone. Okay, that's a long time, three months to last for calibration. pH is the shortest calibration period that you have. Everything else out there has a much longer calibration period. In fact, some instruments actually really don't need to be calibrated because there's really nothing that can go wrong with them, or we've actually built into them a series of features that can calibrate the sensor with every reading. And this comes into our optical sensors. I'm not going to get too deep into that, but just to know that they effectively, it's very difficult for them to fall out of calibration. So, real good long-term deployment. So that's about how long they can last. But okay, well I still need to calibrate at some point. So there's an interesting challenge here. How difficult is it to calibrate? As many of you have said, you've never seen this instrument. Okay? You've never touched it. I don't know, if, it, if that were me, I'd be like, man, I don't want to get near that thing. I don't know what it's going to do. I've never dealt with this. I have no idea how to make it work. 
However, most of you are using a smartphone. Most of you can probably download any app out there and figure out how to make it work in about 30 seconds. It takes me about two minutes. But I guarantee you guys can do something like that. And we've actually designed this whole thing to actually make it effectively super easy to count. And all we need to do, we can demonstrate this. I don't have a mindful time here. If you need to, if you have a meeting, we can have another time. Uh, the meeting or others can, and, uh, can, can come and, and do this later and do a demonstration. You can also see this online to actually look at how easy calibration can be. With the app, there's a thing that says calibration. Click calibration and it gives you pictures. It shows you exactly what you need to do with the instrumentation that you have to do all the calibration. Everything from taking this restrictor off and telling you to take it from this, flipping it over, putting it on, this is called calibration mode. So that you now have a place where you can put your standard solution in and then walk you through the whole setup process. All at this point, all you need to do is lift your phone and hit a button and wait. That's it. No entering of values, not you don't have to know a whole lot about it. You can easily do it. We have a, a uh, we have one of our, our colleagues has done this, uh, where he took uh, he actually gave this sensor <coughs> setup to his grandmother. His 80-year-old grandmother, who is not a scientist, not someone who's ever done anything like this, and said, could you please try to calibrate this? She can use a cell phone, apparently. And guess what? She did it, no problem. I gave this when my children were really little. I love this. I gave it to my six-year-old son when he was six. And I said, can you calibrate this thing? And he's like, I don't even know what the word calibration means. And I said, well, I'll show you what the word means, and just walk through it. You know what he did? Boom, did the whole thing. He said, well, what do I do now? I didn't have him handle chemicals, but you know, he was it. I figure if an 80-year-old grandmother and a six-year-old boy can calibrate this stuff, I'm pretty confident everyone in this room can, can do this. No problem. Right. Yeah, please. Recently we have bonded so I asked him about the delivery solution. He told me it's a mix of the but I was in video and I said, yep. so we need to prepare the solution, but we don't get uh, any solution from the product. So, so that's a great question. So for those of you who didn't hear that, the question was around calibration of turbidity and chlorophyll, right? Is that it? So two sensors. Um, that, uh, that are actually optical sensors. Now, so the really nice thing about that is, yes, can they be calibrated? Absolutely. And they should be used at times for, for calibration and check. However, when they come from the factory, one of the really things, the, the difference between those, the, the, those sensors makes that they're optical sensors. And so the way they are, are set up is that they have a, a, an LED light that emits out of the detector. Now, typically what happens is an LED light will degrade over time. And that's when you need a calibration. I need to calibrate because that light is changing, or maybe the detector is changing. What we've done is we actually put a second detector in there that actually measures the LED light coming out so it knows that it's degrading. And then it's a different detector to adjust it. This is exactly the point where based on every single reading, it adjusts for that. So it's effectively giving you a new calibration every single time that light flashes, because it's taking into account for that, uh, that, uh, that integrated optical compensation for that. So do you need to calibrate it? It's going to be up to you. You can calibrate. Your solution is available. You can absolutely do that. And again, yeah, same thing with the app, easy to do. However, with turbidity, you can actually do, uh, you can just do uh, checks on it as well. And in fact, with the chlorophyll, what we recommend, because because of how the chlorophyll sensor works, is to put it in DI wise. And you should just get zero. And if it doesn't read zero, you can reset it. But you should be very close. Can I have some that? Maybe you have a question. Is, yeah. The solution may not come with the calibration solution that you want. So two sensors, one is turbidity and one is chlorophyll. 
Yes. How frequently have to calibrate this? What was the parameter? Sorry. How frequently do I have to calibrate this? Just in general. How frequent? Sorry. I'll repeat. Just repeat. Sorry. I'm sorry. How frequently do you have to do the calibration? Just in general. general. In general. So in general. So it depends on your sensor. Okay. That's the critical part here. What we typically, so we have recommendations, okay, because we have to have a recommendation based on this. However, what we have seen in the field and what we see with actual operations is that you need to actually calibrate when you start seeing changes in the data that may not be displayed by natural phenomena. So, what that means is typically, I mentioned pH, that's the shortest time period. Your standard operating procedure may say, I need to calibrate every day, every week, before every deployment. Whatever it may be, that's what you should go with. However, if you're doing a continuous deployment on some of those, a pH sensor, just focusing on that, could last anywhere from 30 days to 90 days, typically. However, we have good seawater deployments where we've gone over, we actually went six months. Now, that's un, it's very unusual. You have to have the right environment for that, and it was just lucky that they did that. I wouldn't recommend it. So that's pH. Conductivity, if you have wild swings in your conductivity range, then you may need to calibrate more frequently, especially if you want to make sure you're maintaining the, 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 the linear the linearity between highs and lows. But typically, however, conductivity really doesn't need to be calibrated because there's nothing that can really go wrong with this. Okay. And as I mentioned with the optical sensors, um, they really don't require uh, things of turbidity um, and some fluorometers like just talking about four really it just depends for the actual sensor itself. Now, if you're calibrating it to a specific a site specific thing, you'll need to calibrate at each site uh, as that may be. Today we can add something. Here. Just a general term, uh, I'm a sales guy. Uh, I tell people when you see a same uh, your location, if you see a huge changes uh, within like after one or two months when the data are going everywhere. That's trying to do a calibration. I think there is some impurities are coming or some sensory challenge. That's the easy way to think about how to do calibration. As Adam was talking about, every company or every institute has their own calibration, uh, uh, what do you call it, protocol. If I go to every new site, I would prefer to calibrate once because we don't know how, who has used earlier, where it's coming. So it's all different. I would tell you, you do calibration every day. I can send you a lot of calibration <laughs> which I don't want. Right. Did I answer your question? Did you answer your question? One that we talked, we talked, we started talking about here early on was level. People always ask, as well, can I, you know, about calibrating level? And you can in certain sensors, and it's a whole separate thing, but which ones can be calibrated? Um, the reality is, they don't really need calibration. They really, most people will never know because they're calibrated from the Back. Now, that's great for our instrumentation. And the reason I say that is because our instrumentation actually for level is actually calibrated across the full temperature and pressure range that that sensor is designed to operate. This is very important, okay? Full operating range of that sensor. So that means I can take a level sensor, like this one, this is another one, and I can put it in water that is 15 for, let's say, 10 degrees C, and I can measure water level. Okay. And I can raise the temperature of that water, of the, of that, that water all the way up to, you know, we go to 70 degrees C, and I know that that water level is still going to be accurate because it's calibrated across that full range from the back. And that generally doesn't drift. 
Now, most other manufacturers out there, they only calibrate at one temperature, one pressure. Okay, and it's generally about 20 degrees C. Now, where I'm from, groundwater is not 20 degrees C. Catch my 10. Okay, but I also, we operate in areas, I actually operate in areas where I'm dealing with 100 degrees C water. These aren't great for that, but it's a separate story. But if you have really hot water, what about moving between things? What about dealing with, with a coastal environment where there's diurnal fluctuations? What about dealing with a river where there's, you know, it's sunny, it's dark, temperature change? What about dealing with the groundwater where there's a discharge to that from the, uh, the industry that's putting out hot water into the ground? And then it changes. My water level is not, it's not calibrated across the whole temperature range and pressure range. The water level will be in Now it's And that's the critical part. But you don't have to worry about that. It comes just like that already. Does that help? Another parameter? Good question. Any other questions? This is this is what I'm kind of moving down into the open discussion here. What else can we what else can we talk about? Can you talk about some features and then you think about some of the other sensors or only a we just talked about calibration on the level sensor, and I think that's a, that's a critical part here. I can show a slide on that real quick. Um, so this is this kind of gets into what I was just talking about the level sensor here, um, where the accuracy of the sensor can vary over pressure and over the pressure and temperature range that the sensor is designed to operate. Um, what we're looking at here, so to understand that, um, with a pressure sensor, very quick, um, there's a whole other presentation on this, however. So pressure sensors come in different pressure ranges, okay? And so how you actually have to determine how accurate they may be is based on the percentage of what's called full scale, FS, okay? And that's what this right here, this FS. That's what that means. So the full scale on this is the range of this of the pressure sensor. And the only way I can tell the range of this is by reading what it is, and I should remember because I've been using this one. The range of this one is 60 meters. And now another little thing, and again, I don't want to get too lost in this, but it's 60 meters. That's 60 meters of fresh water. Okay. And that can translate into an actual pressure. Um, but right now, it's easier to think about it in terms of water. It's the amount of water that can be above that sensor. It can, it, can, it can be submerged underwater by 60 meters of water. And it will pass the tactics. And it has the temperature range, um, which I believe goes up to 80 degrees C um, for, for our, our instrumentation. Now, so the accuracy of that is 0.5%, which is right here. This is 0 0.1. So 0 0.05, either side, plus or minus, of full scale. So the way we determine the accuracy of this sensor is we take 0. Yeah, sorry, 0 0.05 percent of 60 meters. What that means, and I don't remember exactly what that number is off the top of my head, uh, but that number, that means a very small number, any value that is smaller than that number could, I want to stress, could be attributed to instrument error. May not, but it may be instrument error. Okay. That's how we determine how accurate these sensors can actually be. Now, with something like this, we want to maintain that accuracy across the full temperature and the full pressure range of the, of the sensor itself. And like I mentioned before, um, what typically we find is right about 20 degrees C where everyone's really, really accurate. Okay, this blue line here, this is us. Okay, we maintain that, that within that 0.05% throughout the full temperature range that we have. These other lines are not just scribbles that we put on a graph. They are actual data from other manufacturers. And no, I'm not going to tell you who they are, because that's not right. But that, what I will tell you, is that is other manufacturers data. And they have this, this is public. That's how we have, that's how we access it. So you can see that. 
So when you're selecting a, a, a level sensor, please look at the accuracy specifications of it. Look at the calibration specifications. And understand that you could, you know, what you're actually getting. If you want bad data, hey, go for it. That's up to you. That's your decision as a professional. I don't like bad data. I don't like to choose bad data. I want the best data I can get. So this, I don't know, I don't hear this. More is about what is your accuracy requirement for your project. Mm -hmm. uh, there are present sets that are available in hundred dollars, and there are present that are available in five hundred dollars or six hundred dollars. There is a difference. It's not only price, but it's more of the technology going behind that. That's one of the idea what I'm most talking about. There is other slide, which is the next one. Uh, I don't know. So the other thing that we have with um, our calibration is a lot of times you, you want to make sure that they're actually done. It, has to, you can't, it can't be one point. It has to be a multi-point calibration. You have to have many, many points uh, in that calibration process. Um, we actually have to do it, I think it's about 16 different points across the range of the cold temperature and pressure range. And that's critical. The other thing with, it, with the Calibration, you want something that's actually certified calibration. This is really important. Especially when you're dealing with, um, you know, if you're dealing, if you're trying to measure the water level in your, you know, in, in a pond in your backyard, sure, that's one thing. But when you're actually working for a government agency and you're actually trying to do regulation, you're actually trying to do, you need really accurate data. You may want something that actually is. Um, certified. So we can actually get something that is it, it, certified by a standard uh, standard agency. Uh, agency. Um, and all of our all of our sensors come with uh, NIST traceable uh, calibrations. Is the idea. We want to make sure that that's that. I don't think there's a lot lot in there. Uh, but we want to make sure, depending on your project, what you may what you may need, uh, and, and make sure the requirements are. Other questions? I know we're about, I think it's about, we're at about 11.24 right now. I think we're going to try to wrap up in about five minutes. But certainly open it to questions, comments, concerns. Yes. We can do that, certainly. So we can actually put this in. The way this actually all works. Water is good. And let me set this up really fast. Oh, actually. Very good. Very good. Very good. You want to start setting up? I'm going to try and get, uh, get the show to uh, show. Is that okay? You want to have them do it? You have them. You can explain. We'll, we'll go that way. Okay. So what we're going to do here, hi, I'm Adam, how are you? <laughs> Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Okay, we're going to have you guys come on and, and do this. So there's a bucket of water. I think I stand around everything on the other side so everybody can see you. So can I ask you, sir, uh, what, we have water level instrument and we have water quality instrument. What do you would like to see first? Yeah, start the water level. Water level. Okay. Sure. We're going to do that. that. Yes. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So we talked about a few things. Remember, we had a, the sensor, the cable. And we're not going to deal with telemetry right now, but then we're going to deal with this one. Okay. So what we're going to have you guys do? Remember how? So what do you think we can connect up first? Yeah. Please, 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 come on, please. This is actually a little easier because I put the phone on the phone and I couldn't get it out of my computer. Okay. 